Well, everybody, what's the crack? And welcome back to episode number 25 of the Inline G Flute Podcast with me, your host, motherfucking Inline G. Ah, that's a lemon seed. Merry Christmas, you filthy animals, and a happy fucking new year. Welcome back to the classical music podcast that your mother told you not to listen to, the Inline G Flute Podcast. So if all goes to plan, this episode will be released on Friday the 22nd of December. The reason I'm saying that is because I'm pre-recording this episode in one week. I also have another episode that should go out before this on Friday the 15th of December as a very, very special guest podcast. But if I make a bollocks of that, which is always possible on this podcast, then this may be released as a contingency emergency episode on the 15th. I sincerely hope that you're listening on the 22nd of December. In which case, yeah. Happy fucking Christmas. At this point in real life, I will be back in Belfast for Christmas. I will be knee deep in Guinness and gin and good times. I'll be having a whole week of boozing back home. But to you guys, happy Christmas or happy whatever the fuck it is you celebrate. Whatever religious holiday or non-religious holiday you celebrate. I hope it's a great one. I was on Facebook, by the way. I know. I know. Just on that note, I was on Facebook. um, And I saw another influential member of the flute community talking out their fucking arse. It's became a regular occurrence in the flute world. This time it was that old classic that middle-aged white lads love to come out with, that classic of, soon it'll be illegal to say happy Christmas, they'll throw you in jail for saying Merry Christmas one of these days. It fucking, they won't, mate, they won't. Not gonna fucking happen, all right? Like, it's always the same fucking idiots, middle-aged, white class, straight, white class? Well, there, <laughs> that was a Freudian slip. Um, on the internet, fucking idiots don't get out of the house and they think oh it's going to be illegal like mate it's not imagine the logistics imagine the practicality of that coming into effect in the common law in the united kingdom imagine imagine you're walking down the street you're walking down some high street in the middle of a british town you think i'll pop into i'll go with boots i'll pop into boots i get myself a mean lean and you bring into the till and they scan your egg and crest sandwich your snack of jacks and your coke zero and the guard says, do you, do you have a Boots car? And you go, no, I don't. And she goes, I'll be $4.99. You go, brilliant. And she goes, cheerio. And you go, cheerio. Oh, by the way, happy Christmas. And then bang, that's it, bang. Shutters down the walls, laser beams, fucking alarm going off, SWAT team kicking down the door. Get in the ground, get in the fucking ground. And they fucking push you down. And they're putting handcuffs on your head. Don't move, you fucking scumbag, don't move. Do you not know the law? It's not... <laughs> <laughs> it's not it's not gonna happen it's not gonna be illegal to say happy christmas you fucking idiots if you're the kind of person who thinks that well first of all you shouldn't be listening to this podcast it's not for you go listen to jordan peterson or ben shapiro one of those cunts um stop saying that word um but do not listen to this podcast if you're one of those people that believes that please go listen to another podcast oh man ridiculous anyway 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 um i was gonna write a lovely festive episode this week a christmas episode and I was starting to write it, but there's been this episode in my head for a while now. I've talked about it a few times in this podcast. It's been brewing within me for ages now, and I need to get it out. And this is the last time before Christmas. Also, I finished all my work. Well, not all my work, but my hard work before Christmas, so I can enjoy a drink on this podcast. And it just felt like the right night to let this episode go out. So, this week's episode, title pending, but I think I'll stick with this. A beginner's guide to classical music, and then in brackets, just enough to get you laid. So it is what it says on the tin. If you are the person who knows fuck all about classical music, you know nothing. After this episode, you will know enough to impress the boy or the girl or the person of your dreams at a party. And you never know, maybe someone will end up getting their flute played. And it is also, for those of you who are classical musicians, who play music, this is a lovely back to basics episode for you guys. It's it's where you get to take off the artist's glasses and look at the industry with those fresh, sparkly eyes that have been beaten out of you over the last period of your life. So I do firmly believe not only is this episode some of my finest work, but it is an episode for everybody, one for all. So what's on the menu today? Well, first of all, 
We're going to do some quick explanations on all the different fancy foreign words that you get in classical music, all the different terms. In just a few minutes, you're going to know your symphonies from your concertos and your arts from your elbow. I've got it all covered. Then we're going to go through the big areas of classical music, because classical music is a genre, but there is the classical period of classical music. So I'm going to differentiate the two, and we're going to go through the big four areas of classical music, the Baroque, the classical, the Romantic, and the contemporary. We're not going to talk about the Renaissance, because it's dog shit. And then I'm going to give you the headline composers from each era, the big names, the ones who are bringing in the box office, the big ticket composers for each of those four eras. What makes each era unique and then a recording to listen to. Now, because this is a flute podcast, it'll be a flute recording in some kind of shape or form. And by the end of this one single podcast episode, you'll be ready to go out there and chat to a member of your desired sex and impress them with how articulate, educated and downright fucking cultured you really are. So if you can't be arsed to learn an instrument, talk on the talk is the next best thing. And where better to learn to talk shite than with Europe's number one talk, shy talker. All I ask in return is that you name your firstborn child Gareth, please. Or actually, don't even do that, genuinely. If you could do me a favor, like and subscribe to this podcast. I know you hear everyone say that, but it really, really helps out. And I'm so shit at marketing this podcast. So please, wherever you're listening to this, subscribe and like it. If everyone who actually listened to this and watched it subscribe, subscribed and liked, I would be flying at the minute. So please do that. Please, 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 wherever you are, give it a five star rating. Like and subscribe, comment, talk, tell your friends about it, share it somewhere. It's all free. It doesn't cost you a penny to do any of that. Please, please, please do that. And if you're not, if you're going to review it, but you're not going to give it five stars, please keep your opinions to yourself. So anyway, guys, if you're ready, go pour yourself a drink, go get yourself a nice gin and lilt, strap in for a fucking belter of an episode. So here we are, classical music terms. We're going to get through this really quick, guys. This is going to be bang, 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 this podcast. Here are all the terms that you need to know. If you memorize this section alone, it might even get you a wee smooch on a night out. So, first term, classical music. That is a genre, okay? It's a genre. It's a very wide genre. It's what we use to describe everything I'm going to talk about today. It's a very wide genre. There's a lot of different things for it. But when we say classical music, we do not mean the classical era. Classical music basically is summarized by instruments or combinations of instruments that may be featured in the orchestra, from sort of 1600 until today. Classical music. The next thing, an orchestra. Pretty self-explanatory. It's a big group of instruments. Generally plays classical music classical music, and has four different groups of instruments. So the four different groups are the woodwind section, the woodwind section, the string section, the percussion section, and the brass section. Okay? A um, couple of words to talk about with orchestras. Yes, we have couple of different types of orchestras. The one you'll hear most common are chamber orchestras, philharmonic orchestras, and symphonic orchestras, or symphony orchestras. Chamber orchestras are smaller orchestras. There you are. They're small. Usually 20 people, 25, something like that, max. Uh, Philharmonic and symphony, once upon a time, did have a difference in their meanings. There were different types of orchestra. This is way back in the days because of philharmonic societies popping up and stuff in the 1900s, but essentially nowadays the two terms are fully interchangeable. For example, in London, there is the London Philharmonic Orchestra, the London Symphony Orchestra. They are the same size, they play the same repertoire, they have no differences. It is two interchangeable terms entirely. Now, we talk about a symphony as a piece of music, not a symphony orchestra, but a symphony to write a symphony or to play a symphony. And a symphony is a piece of music for an orchestra. It's usually four movements and lasts around 45 minutes to an hour. The way I compare it for you guys is a modern day album in terms of how much time it takes to write, the scope, the different styles, all under one kind of coherent theme and the length of it. It's like a modern artist releasing an album. So to write a symphony or two a year is to be compared to a pop singer releasing an album or two a year. That's the kind of time we're putting into it. Concerto, beautiful Italian word. That is a piece for orchestra with soloist. Usually three movements, good half an hour in length, sometimes longer, not to be confused with a solo within a symphony. So for example, in some symphonies you get a small flute solo, a couple of minutes, max, max, where the flute will get a chance to shine. That is the flute player within the orchestra. A flute concerto would be where a new flute player, a guest flute player will come in, the soloist in a concerto stands in front of the orchestra, and they play with the orchestra as a soloist the whole way through. They are the star of the show. 
usually they're a soloist as well like they're not a player within the orchestra they're a famous player that's brought in just to do this specific concerto so it's a much bigger role they are the star you can get concertos for every instrument a flute concerto is an inst is a concerto for flute and orchestra a violin concerto is for violin and orchestra etc etc ad infinitum so that's what a concerto is an opera next one it's like a musical it's like musical theater but in classical music form there we are done and dusted chamber music chamber music basically anything written in a smaller scale chamber the word chamber in general when we talk about classical music just means it was played in a smaller venue it means smaller numbers of players chamber music when we talk about it usually means music for maximum sort of eight instruments at a time maximum usually one to two to three um sonata that's a term that comes up that's a type of music you can play a sonata similar kind of length probably to a concerto or a symphony quite long but usually only written for two instruments one melodic with piano so a flute sonata is flute and piano a violin sonata is violin and piano and that's the name of the, that's the style of piece a couple of last ones solo that's the italian word for solo to be alone to do it on your own solo ensemble it's the french word ensemble it just means a group of people uh the key of a piece so to say a piece is in d or g it means the tonal center of that piece is that note okay so the whole piece sort of revolves around that note if a piece is in g major chances are the first note is going to be a g and the last one's going to be a g and the whole thing never moves too far away from g that's the tonal center when you're doing a piece when you're giving the tonality to a piece you give the key so the letter or the note a b c d e f or g and then you have major or minor really simply the two different you can have a major and minor for every note up to g major generally means the theme of the music and the style of the music is happy joyous triumphant all those positive emotions minor music tends to be sad uh, any other words that come with sad i can't think of any at the minute but you know what i mean sad tumultuous is a good word stormy dark those are minor keys and a conductor is the fellow that waves a stick he conducts the orchestra basically his role is that any artistic choices made within the orchestra at any point come down to the conductor he's in charge or he or she is in charge of every single artistic decision they are at the wheel okay now if you want if you've listened to me for all that well done to you I hope you can memorize a few of those but if you can't here's one takeaway line to memorize to show off at a party try saying something like i generally prefer symphonies for their emotional magnitude however the right concerto with the right soloist could potentially match that say that at a party and see how many smooches you get you'd be beating the girls off with a big stick by right we have to keep scooching on here we've got a lot to get through we said earlier classical music is the genre not the period now, what do I mean by the period? It means classical music as a genre can be split up into four significant periods of music, where the music is a little bit different in each one and has different rules and composers within each one. We're going to go through the major four ones. Now, the first one we're going to talk about is the Baroque era. Before that, there is the Renaissance era. The Renaissance era is dog shit. They hadn't really discovered music properly yet. If you're into all that kind of Gregorian chant, the oh, and all the monks and all that shit, great, you go listen to that, but mostly it's shite so i just get past that we sort of accept we sort of accept i sort of accept the baroque era as when music really started so baroque era the baroque era not to be called the baroque era like americans i don't know why they do that it actually it's like kneels on a chalkboard to me when someone says baroque Ugh. baroque more like <laughs> i'm on the vodka this week mm. Baroque era, 1600 to 1750, more or less, give or take. There's always a little period of overlap with these these years. Now, what makes the Baroque era unique or different? Or how can we tell that a piece is a Baroque piece? Firstly, the instruments. There is no piano yet. The piano has not been invented. There is the precursor to the piano, which was called the harpsichord. Someone once described the sound of a harpsichord as skeletons dancing on a tin roof and that's quite close it sounds like a stringed instrument it looks like a piano you play it like a piano but it plucks strings it means that the minute you hit it it decays if you hit the key really hard or really gently it doesn't get louder or quieter it has the same level the same dynamic dynamic is what we call louder or quieter the same dynamic no matter how hard you press the key so it was the old instrument and they were at the center of everything in the baroque period now generally back in the baroque period the groups of or or instruments or orchestras chamber groups everything was smaller it was done on a smaller scale so the orchestras were much smaller 15 20 people 
Max. Um, also, the instruments that they had back then are not like the instruments we have now. For example, the flute, you can see my gorgeous modern flute, that came about in the 1900s. Back then the flute had no keys, just a couple of holes, maybe one or two keys popped up, I've talked about this before. Very, very basic instrument in comparison to what we have now, and that applies to pretty much every instrument. If you look at a Baroque clarinet or a Baroque oboe, Baroque bassoons, there is no such thing as a Baroque clarinet, is there? I think that. I don't know, actually. But in any case, the other ones have Baroque instruments. Baroque violin, Baroque cello, all the precursors of those instruments. They're very different, much more simple. Not as flexible, but a different sound. Um, often, they were writing music with religious themes. Obviously, in this kind of era in musical history, religion was ruling Europe, where a lot of this music was written, because America still wasn't fucking real. Um, so a lot of it had religious themes, and a lot of the composers would have worked for the court. Uh, the music was very balanced and very structured. So you would have had phrases like a little tune across four bars. It would have been repeated across another four bars. Then there would have been two tunes across eight bars. The piece would have maybe made up 64 bars or 128 bars. It was always divided in two. You could always count it. It was always measured, square, lovely. Um, very mathematical, almost in its approach. Most of what we call harmony... Modern harmony. I'd say 95% of modern harmony in our understanding of music now was discovered and perfected in the Baroque era. Discovered, certainly. Perfected, certainly. Uh, I said certainly twice there, but certainly by both. By the same composer, Johann Sebastian Bach. He took harmony to its absolute limits. He discovered everything there is to discover about harmony. You all know who Bach is if you don't keep that name in mind. There are no symphonies in the Baroque era. We're too early for symphonies. There's a couple of operas, precursors to operas. Um, there's more suites. So a suite, a collection of dances usually. Dances were a big thing as well. It was music that had a function or a purpose that was written for either to express a religious idea or religious sentiment, religious story, or to dance. That was essentially what we wrote music for in the Baroque era. Uh, big name composers of the Baroque era. Handel, George Friedrich Handel, Antonio Vivaldi, and Johann Sebastian Bach. Now, when you look at Bach, there's a lot of Bachs because Daddy Bach, Johann Sebastian, he got about a bit. He swung his flute about him. So he had, I don't know how many kids he had. I had a lot of kids and most of them are composers. But they're all pretty much dog shit. They're not as good as Johann Sebastian. So when we talk about Bach, unless we specify otherwise, we mean J.S. Bach. Johann, Johann Sebastian Bach. Um, he's the main man. So I'm going to give you an example piece from the Baroque era and I'm going to play it. Well, not now. I'm going to add it in post-editing. I'm way too drunk to play it now. Uh... The example piece is going to be from Johann Sebastian Bach and one of his orchestral suites, the B minor suite, is second one of those. Again, a collection of dances, we're going to be playing the movement, the Bedinieri, which when you play it, when you hear it, sorry, you will know straight away it is the old ringtone from the Nokia phones if you are over the age of 25. If you're younger than that, you probably don't know what I'm talking about. But anyway, it's that one. This recording that I've played is by the Freiburg Baroque Orchestra. So that means they are playing period instruments. They are not playing modern instruments. They are playing either instruments from the time of Bach or exact replicas of that time to try and recreate the exact sound that Bach would have heard at the time of composing. It's a short movement. Okay, it's only a minute and a half. You will know this. And the solo is, of course, on the flute. So that's why we picked it. But it is one of the most famous pieces ever written, probably for the ringtone. So anyway, here is Bach's Badinery from the Orchestra Suite Number 2 in B minor, by the Freiburg Baroque Orchestra. <laughs> Beautiful. I didn't even hear it. I'm just shooting through. Right, next era, the classical era. We've moved on from the Baroque. Join me on the journey. Now remember, the Baroque ended somewhere between 1730 to 1750. So the overlap means that the classical era is starting up around that time. And it ran up until around about 1820. So we'll say 1730 to 1820 to encompass everything. That's the classical era. Now what makes the classical era different to the Baroque? 
theorem. So the Baroque era, at the end of its time, started to get quite complicated, quite murky with the harmonies. Things were getting very heavily layered. And classical, the classical era sort of returned to tunes, great melodies, things you could whistle on your way home, brilliant melodies. One big thing that changed it a lot was the piano was invented. The modern piano that we know it was invented and perfected during this era. So if you hear a piano in a piece of music, immediately it cannot be from the Baroque era. Unless someone's playing it you know, for an effect, but if there's a piano, it's not from the Baroque era. Um, but the thing about the piano was the piano can play louder or quieter depending on how hard you hit it. Big change. Before, if you wanted music to get louder or quieter in the Baroque era, generally speaking, you added or took away instruments. Now, not just the piano, but also the instruments are getting a little bit better. They're capable of doing more things, so we can add dynamics within it. So terrace dynamics is what, he, what we call it when if you want the piece to get louder, you just add an instrument. They're on their way out, and now instruments are starting to play a little bit more expressionally with the volume levels. So they're getting more advanced the instruments. They're still not like our modern instruments. We're still not at that level yet. But in terms of music, uh, symphonies are now becoming popular. They're becoming a big thing. The orchestras are getting slightly bigger. We're talking about 40 people now in an orchestra. Um, structure and balance are still very important though. That's why you can see the direct relation to the Baroque era, orchestra or the Baroque era. This is not a revolution. It's a continuation of what went before. So that, in that essence, it is very similar to the Baroque era. But the giveaway is always the piano to tell the difference between the two. Now, the big names of the classical era, the big headline composers. Joseph Haydn was probably the first big one, the most one of the most well-known ones. Uh, I think Haydn wrote a hundred and either 104 or 110 symphonies. I probably should have Googled this before I started recording this podcast, but I wasn't planning to talk about Haydn. But anyway, that's the professionals you expect on this podcast. But there are two other composers that tower above the classical era. That is Ludwig van Beethoven and, of course, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Not to be confused with my cat. Mozart embodies the classical era. Mozart is the classical era. He's everything about it. He personifies it in every single way. If you want more information on Mozart, you can go back to my previous episode. Mozart here to the flute, aka myth busting or something. I can't remember what I called it. I think it's episode number 21. It's got Mozart in the title. Great episode. I do a bit of background on Mozart. Anyway, Mozart clocked out. Dead. Brown bread. 35 years old. 35 years young. I'm four years away from that man and I have not achieved half as much because he wrote... 41 sympathies. Sympathies? Symphonies. That is a typo on my laptop. (laughs) Man, you could put anything in this. I'm like one of those newsreaders. You could put anything in this and I would read it out in this podcast. And I wrote this. This is what this is the problem is with an independent podcast. I can't blame anyone else. I can't sack my writer because I am the writer. (laughs) I am the captain of the ship and I'm going down with it. 41 symphonies, which if you had said an artist nowadays had wrote 41 albums by the time they're 35, you go, not a fucking chance. Unless it's Prince, not a chance. So it tells you Mozart's output was massive. Everything was great about it. Opera is taking a much bigger role in the classical era. Mozart, Mozart writes operas. Mozart writes great operas. We have The Magic Flute. We have Cosi Fan Tutte. We have Don Giovanni. There's great operas being written by Mozart. Beethoven was a big part of this period as well, but we're going to talk about him in a minute. Now, the example piece I'm going to play for you guys now is the first movement of Symphony No. 40 in G minor, played by the London Classical Players Orchestra, conducted by Roger Norrington, or Sir Roger Norrington, excuse me very much. I hear, now you know what that title means. Now when someone says something like that, you know what each little bit of that title means. You know what a symphony is. You know what's number 40. You know what G minor will probably mean. The centers around G. It's a bit sad. You know the London Classical Players Orchestra. And you know what a conductor is. And in this case, it's an English guy. Look at that. You're learning. I'm learning too. Also in this recording, although it's been recorded recently, it is on period instruments again. So they're playing the instruments that are very reflective of Mozart's time. This piece is composed by Mozart. When you're trying to choose a Mozart tune, there's so many. I, You would not believe how many tunes of Mozart you know. You listen to this right now, you know at least 10 Mozart melodies. You just don't realise you do. But this one really shows off what's going on in the orchestra. Now, it's not a flute piece, but there is a flute in it. And it's cool to listen to the flute because it is a Baroque flute. Almost sounds a little bit like a recorder. Baroque flute, classical flute. The actual flute is not different. But anyway, 
Enjoy this. So, before we continue on, we're doing well for time here. 23 minutes I've got written down-ish. We're doing well for time here. I'm getting through this rightly. The the drinks helping. And for my video listeners, I know that looks monstrous, that drink. But what am I drinking? I am on a vodka and cherry cola with some sliced up lemon in it and a decorative umbrella with a metal straw served in a Guinness glass with four ice cubes. That is very decadent of me. But as I said, work's calmed down a bit, so I'm enjoying myself tonight. You can see my energy levels are back. I'm feeling I'm feeling like the way I used to in those old podcasts back in the old days. Anyway, drink. Yeah, I'm drinking that. Why am I telling you about my drink? Because this podcast, I know if you've heard this already, skip ahead a few seconds. This podcast is free. It will always be free. I will never, ever, ever charge you guys for more content of this podcast. Ever. Everyone will get the same content, the same quality of content, the same amount for free. Always and forever. Pinky fucking promise, right? But if you would like to donate to the podcast, it is unbelievably appreciated. I cannot tell you how much it means, especially recently when the donations have been coming in. We've got enough of a listener now. I cannot tell you how much it means to me, guys. It, it blows my mind. I will try to, if you leave contact details when you're donating... Or if I recognize your name from Instagram or TikTok, I will send you a message, of course, saying thank you. If I have never sent you a message, there's two or three people that I haven't been able to find, please reach out and tell me that you're one of the people that donated. You don't have to, but it'd be nice to know because I want to thank you. But if not, you can take this as your thank you. So you can donate to the podcast, whoever you are when you're listening. Um, There is a link in the description of wherever you're listening to this podcast. Also, you can head over to my Instagram page at Gareth Houston Flute and over there, you can hit the link in my bio and find a button to donate. Now, how much do you donate? I reckon, or I recommend, if you enjoy this podcast, I release an episode a week, roughly an hour a week, give or take. So that's four episodes a month. If you listen to all these episodes, or even one of these episodes, and you saw me in a pub and you thought, fuck, there's Gareth. I really enjoy his content. I'm going to buy him a drink. You can do that virtually. There you are. So I recommend donating whatever the price of a pint or a Dr. Pepper costs in your country. You can do that once a month, max. Do it as frequently as you want, to be honest. But doing that, it does help me a lot because the more donations I get, the more time and effort I can spend on this podcast. There has been times where I've genuinely thought, I cannot do an episode a week. Donations let me do that. They let me turn away a little bit of work and make this part of my professional portfolio. I can dedicate time to it. I'm not spending money on equipment or new stuff. It's not that much money, but it is the kind of money that I can say, right, well, I don't need to teach for an extra hour this week. I've made the money already in donations. What I can do instead is donate that hour of my time to a podcast. So that's what you get. If you can donate and you've got the money, it's incredibly appreciated. Thank you very much. If you can't afford it, that's grand. No problems. You can listen for free. No problems at all. So anyway, let's get back to the podcast. Thank you very much. Ah, the romantic era. Is the third of our four eras. We've had the Baroque. We've had the Classical era. I hope you're bearing with me here now, guys. Don't get lost because you're getting to the good stuff now. We're really getting there. The Romantic era, roughly 1830 to 1910-ish. It's always a bit of an ish, all right, with these things. Now, this is where things change. Now, by romantic, we don't necessarily mean the definition of romantic is in a romantic partner, as in to love someone or to do things with the idea of love behind it, but more romantic in the sense of an emotion. For example, when you say something like uh, the romance of the FA Cup, the football competition, people always say the romance of the FA Cup. They don't mean they don't mean they want to buck the FA Cup. What they mean is it's the emotion of it and the story and the history. That's what we're talking about in the romantic era. We're talking about emotion. Everything centered around emotion, not necessarily love, often is, but not necessarily. 
So what happened in the Romantic era is composers stopped prioritizing form, rules, structure and balance and instead did everything they could to prioritize explicitly expressing emotion. That came first. It was the be all and end all of the Romantic era is to do every mean necessary to express what you want to express and fuck everything else. So instruments got better. They got more advanced. And to be honest, by the end of the Romantic era, the instruments they're playing are pretty much the same as what we're playing now. If I was to play a flute from the late Romantic era, it would sound a little bit different, but it's more or less the same as this beauty sitting here. Um, same with most instruments. There's not many new instruments getting invented. Already by this point now, we've added the saxophone and things like that. So we're up to what we've got now, essentially. Um, orchestras get big. Orchestras get fucking big. By the end of the Romantic era, we are talking orchestras well over 100 sometimes. While back in the Baroque and Classical era, an orchestra would have had two flute players, some orchestras are now putting up to five for certain pieces. So orchestras are getting big. Harmonies are getting richer. The music's getting darker and creamier. There's more going on. With more players in an orchestra and more parts, you can have more things happening at one time. Form goes out the window entirely in some cases. They don't care if it balances or if it adds up the four or if it works out mathematically. They don't give a shit as long as the idea comes across. And that's the big change. Now the change starts with my man. The love of my life, Ludwig van Beethoven, my favourite composer. He began writing in the classical era and in the classical style. But he was responsible for switching from classical to romantic. For me, personally, the Romantic era begins with the very, very first note of Beethoven's third symphony, the Eroica Symphony. As soon as that first note starts, it's like, fuck, here we go, that's it, music's changed. Different ballgame now. The first note of that symphony, music history was changed forever. It's just, it slaps you in the face and the whole symphony is a roller coaster of a symphony. I fucking love it. But that's where you went, wow, okay. He's pushing music way beyond what we thought. He stopped giving a shit about the rules. He stopped giving a shit about religious ideas or anything. He's just going for it. So that means also in the Romantic era, we're getting some melodies that are incredibly over the top. And I love it. We're getting bigger and better and stronger. Symphonies are very, very, very popular this time. But they're getting bigger and more dramatic. And composers aren't writing as many. Now, composers as well this era, they're not getting as funded by the church anymore. In the late 1800s to the 1900s, we're seeing the rise of secularism in Europe. So composers are getting different donors, different ways of making money. So they're not necessarily having to write for the church. But they're not writing. The symphonies are very popular, but the composers aren't writing as much. So Mozart wrote 41. Haydn wrote 110 or 104. We're still not sure. Um, but composers at this time, they were writing less. Actually, one thing that's very interesting in the Romantic era is a lot of composers died while writing their 10th symphony. They got to number 9 and then they died while writing their 10th. Beethoven wrote 9 symphonies, he died. Zvorzak wrote 9 symphonies, died. Mahler, 9 symphonies, dead. Uh, Schubert, 9 symphonies, dead. It started to become a thing. Shostakovich, who got up to 15 symphonies, actually called, while he was writing his 10th, 9th symphony, he called it number 10. And then when he was writing his 10th symphony, he called it number 9. So the curse of the 10th symphony didn't get him. And it worked. So there we are. So composers are writing less, but they're writing bigger pieces. Now, who are the big names of this era? Early on, we're talking Beethoven and Franz Schubert as well, another very famous composer. But as we get later on into the late Romantic era, we are getting people like Richard Strauss, Wagner, Chopin, Tchaikovsky, Shostakovich, Rimsky-Korsakov, all the big ones. The Russians are playing a big role at this time. Berlioz in France, Debussy, Ravel are still in that heavy Romantic era. The Germans are churning out Strauss and Wagner and all those boys. There's a lot of composers coming out. It, it's, it gets hardcore. The music is hardcore as fuck. It's pushing things to its absolute limits. I love this era. I really love this era. This is my kind of bread and butter. Is these heavy, heavy romantic pieces. There are so many pieces I could recommend. And the era in general is a podcast in itself. Um, unfortunately, not a lot for the flute. The flute kind of suffered a little bit in the romantic era. We didn't get a lot of compositions in here. Pre-romantic and post-romantic we have a lot. But we didn't get a huge amount in the romantic era in terms of solo music for us. But anyway... The whole year is all emotion and to listen to it is just great. It's great. There's something for everything. So it was really hard to choose my recommended piece for this. 
But the good thing is, because the instruments are now essentially what modern instruments are, I don't have to look for period instruments to show you guys what they sound like. I can pick any recording. So I just picked one of my favorite recordings of all time. It is Lars Vo on piano with the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra with Sir Simon Rattle conducting. And they are playing the first movement of Grieg's Piano Concerto in A minor. Grieg was a composer from Norway. This concerto is brilliant. It's brilliant. It's heavy and romantic. So it's a piano concerto. Lars Vo was an incredible pianist who very sadly passed away. I think this year or last year very recently anyway with a very short illness i had the pleasure of seeing him play this piece live unbelievable man the first note of this you're going to hear the recording i'm going to play it from the start the very first note is a big heavy crash in the piano normally in the classical and baroque era they warm me up and they have a little interlude with the orchestra and then the soloist comes in in this piece the soloist just fucking kicks down the door and comes in and goes i'm here baby and I saw him do this live, and he's a big, tall guy, Lars Vogt. And when he hit the piano, you could feel the place shake. Like, he's a big, strong lad, and he just thumped the shit out of it. And it was great. There's a video of it somewhere on my phone. I have to find it. It was unbelievable. I watched the rehearsal of him doing it. Oh, my God. So, anyway, that's the piece I've left for you here. For me, it's the best opening few seconds in any piece of classical music. It is brilliant. It is just fucking drama. It's a dramatic piece. The whole thing is dramatic. I would recommend listening to the entire first movement. I'll put the description, I'll put in the description the links to the Spotify for all these pieces. But this one, I would listen to the first movement. If you enjoy the tumultuousness and storminess of it, listen to the whole concerto, but be aware that the second movement is a calmer, happier, more chilled out one. I often skip the second movement, just go straight into the third. So that's worth knowing. Please don't listen to the first movement, love it. Start the second one, think, oh, I don't like this anymore. Give the third one a lash as well. It's often the case in concertos. Um, so it's brilliant. It's a brilliant concerto. It's full of flute solos as well, which is great. There's a couple of famous ones in the first uh, movement as well. So anyway, I'm going to stop talking and let Lars Vogt take you on a journey. Enjoy this very short segment of Grieg's A Minor Piano Concerto played by Lars Vogt and the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra conducted by Sir Simon Rattle. Okay, here we are, 35 minutes. We're doing well, lads. We're really doing well. We got a lot through here. And we're going to go to the contemporary slash modern era. Um, you can choose your name for it. They are interchangeable terms. We're talking 1920-ish, 1920, 1930, around that until present day. So that's the era we are currently in in Western classical music is the contemporary or modern era. This whole thing is a separate podcast. It's a very, very, very long era with a lot of things going on and the development of popular music in the 30s and 20s and what's happened obviously between then until now means that so much has happened in music and we're in a different world now and it's hard to describe it all. So to be honest, it's one of the least interesting periods for a lot of people anyway. So I won't talk about it too much. But what you need to know is at the start of the contemporary era, tonality went out the window we started looking at things called like a tonality so basically what happened in the romantic era was as we got to the end they basically done everything they could do they pushed the instruments and the form and the structure and the size of ensembles right to their limits even the types of music they were playing and the harmonies and the chords everything was pushed to the limits and then after that they went fuck it there's nothing left to do what if we explore taking away tonality so that means the whole idea and basis of what we understand music to be thrown out the window so form goes out the window tonality goes out the window we're looking at very mathematical compositions to draw lines it's the modern it's the modern era so it's comparable to modern art whatever stereotypes you have of modern art 
it's the same thing with this era of music for a lot of the music we're in that kind of weird thing where you would listen to and go what the fuck's that one of the most famous examples of this um which is not my chosen piece because it's a waste of fucking time playing an excerpt for you is you might be familiar with it it's a piece called 433 so four minutes 33 seconds 433 by john cage the american composer he wrote it for full orchestra originally there is versions of it for piano and other arrangements which is so fucking stupid and you have to buy the music and the music costs a fortune it is four minutes and 33 seconds of absolute silence so what will happen is in the original performance in the original score for orchestra the conductor will walk on stage the instruments will get ready they'll pick their instruments up they'll all be ready the conductor will count them in and fuck all will happen and they'll just sit there and the conductor will go through bar after bar of silence he'll conduct it and there's nothing happening and then he finishes the first movement they put their instruments down they go fuck that was a, that was a harp on wasn't it no jesus i'm naggered do you fancy a pint after this and then they got up second movement back at it fuck all don't play no noise absolute silence they do that for four minutes and 33 and then they're done now obviously a lot of people think that's bullshit i think it's genius because man the amount of times people have said to me sure i could have done that well why didn't you john cage is rolling in money over there it was a brilliant idea if you could have done it why didn't you where's your 4033 where's your billions that you could have done it was brilliant and it was the idea of the piece was essentially to break down the the etiquette of a concert hall and i think what john cage was hoping to find out is when it was first played how long would it be before orchestra or audience members would start going what the fuck's going on here how long is it before you break social convention and actually just stand up and go excuse me are you going to fucking play or what is there any chance where is that line before people will pretend to go like oh this is great this is wonderful modern art and then they'll go actually i paid for this ticket can you play a fucking tune please they want to find out the line and that's brilliant from john cage it's an example of that but this is where we're going they're experimenting with things and music because we've done everything else so they're pushing it i actually love the era i'm a big fan of contemporary music i love playing it i've talked about it in the podcast episode with ashling agnew i love contemporary music in every form but as i said i can't cover it all in this era so i'm going to give you one example of it in a minute big names in the early contemporary era we are talking composers like pierre boulez caroline stockhausen john cage a lot of the americans john cage aaron copeland people like that um schoenberg Anton Schoenberg was probably the big one that kicked that off. A lot of people say he started the contemporary area. He sort of started with the experimentation of atonality, 12-tone system, along with Stravinsky, the other famous composer in this era. Um, Schoenberg belonged to the second Viennese school. So when you talk about the Viennese school of music, it was a collection of composers. The first Viennese school is Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, all in the Vienna around the same time. The second Viennese school is much later. It is Schoenberg belg and weber webern um so much more much different composers writing contemporary music that's the two viennese schools that's a fun fact to throw into a conversation say oh i much prefer the first viennese school of composition to the the second composition school of vienna oh i'm treating you guys well here so the piece i'm going to leave you with to give you an idea of how weird this era is it's by pierre boulez it's called le marteau sans met and it's by the Ensemble Anticontemporain, which is a it's an ensemble in Paris that specialises in this kind of music. So it's a small group of players specialising in this. The piece is written by Pierre Boulez. It is composed by Pierre Boulez and it is conducted by Pierre Boulez. So it's all about him. He was a bit of a prick, but I shouldn't speak ill of the dead. He died a few years ago. It is weird as fuck. So strap in. There's a lot of fluid in it. Enjoy it. Here's Boulez. <laughs> So there we are, guys. We did it. The entire history of Western classical music, or at least enough of it to get you the ride in well under an hour. Now, where else would you get this kind of content? See, this is it. When I'm not busy and when I have the time to record this podcast, I'm all energy, man. 
I even had to wait, genuine true story, I had to wait for 15 minutes to record this podcast because there was a giant fucking fly knocking about here, swinging about the room and it wouldn't leave and I couldn't catch it so I had to wait for it to leave. That's that's the glamour and lifestyle. I was trying to catch it actually. Once the kid, don't know why I'm telling you this now, I've had a drink. Um, Once the kid, I caught a fly and put it in the freezer, the big giant one, put it in the freezer, took it out and tied a bit of string around it and then you have a, uh, a fly on a string, a pet fly. So if you want to do that when you go home, knock yourselves out. I don't know if that's animal torture, is it? In any case, I didn't do that with this fly. Why, why am I talking about that? Oh, yeah. We did it. We got through it all. So, guys, this is going to be a goodbye for a little while. Don't worry, not forever. I'll be back. I will do my goddamn best to record a podcast episode for the week between Christmas and New Year's. But I don't know. I will do my absolute best. I've got a guest in mind, but it depends how much I drink. At the worst case, I've got a little backup podcast planned, which I will do solo. But I'm glad to hear some of you appreciated the solo episode as well, as well as the guest episodes. I suppose I am talking in retrospect now because during this podcast episode, I've watched my, during the recording, I've watched my notifications come in and my guest for this week, the week I'm recording, this is the 15th, has been confirmed. So I'll be recording that tomorrow night. They'll come out on Friday the 15th tomorrow night not for you guys tomorrow i'm talking from the past this is the ghost of christmas past um so it will come out so what did you guys all think of last week's superb episode with my special guest i hope you enjoyed it um yeah i'll do that i'll record another episode during the break and then i'll be back to us in the new year fresh and ready to go so guys i really hope you have a wonderful christmas or a wonderful holiday period enjoy it eat chocolates be merry have a great time watch your favorite christmas movies I think I might stick on them up with Christmas Carol myself tonight and just I always cry at the wee scene where there's a wee cold mice funny story actually well I've got time sure we're running ahead of time here I'll tell you a couple of funny stories when I <laughs> when I was 20 21 I think it was my 21st birthday I was living in Cardiff still and I was 20 I made a lot of friends who were on Erasmus like European exchange and they left that year but they all flew back for my 21st birthday and we lived in like a proper student house went out in the pish Two nights in a row, Friday, Saturday, totally drunk. Sunday, all hungover. Everyone's flying home on Monday morning. There's about 15 of us in this house in different rooms, bodies strewn all over the place. And we all get up and we're hungover. And because my birthday is so late in the year, we're like, oh, let's watch a Christmas movie. So we stuck on Muppets Christmas Carol. And it was so funny. One of my friends from the time, who was a big, strong rugby lad, big, brave, you know, strong boy, that real stereotype of like a rugby lad. When the wee rats, when the wee, when the meeses with cheeses, when they get cold and they start shaking, he started crying in the middle of it. And it was so fucking funny. And then his girlfriend was like cold in his hand to make sure he didn't show that everyone else was crying. And then that made him cry more. <laughs> and then there was, everyone was crying around the place, man. Hangovers are wild. So watch a Christmas movie. Enjoy it. Cry over it. My Christmas Day tradition, we watch School of Rock, my favorite movie of all time. And we get quite drunk with my brother. We do a drinking game, so I'm going to do that this year. I hope you have some great Christmas traditions. I hope you're playing some gigs, man. I'm not playing a gig this year at Christmas. How weird is that? I'm rambling here. You still want to hear this? This is absolute dog shit. Guys, have a great Christmas. Have a great time. Have a wonderful New Year. I'll be speaking to you before New Year anyway. Thank you so much for the support of this podcast up until now. It has been so appreciated. You guys have been wonderful, especially the reaction to last week's episode. I wasn't looking for sympathy but I got it anyway with you guys and it is very appreciated. I'm so happy to be connected to this community. These are fucking lovely. I love you all. And if you're new to this, it is your first episode. Thank you for tagging along. Thank you for making it all the way to the end. You're very appreciated. Go check out another episode and please stay. Go tell your mates about this. And for the love of Christ, subscribe. Subscribe and like and share and do all that stuff. It doesn't cost anything and it really, really helps. Anyway, right, I'm rambling. Go, have a lovely Christmas. I'm going to have another gin. That's not even a gin, that's a vodka. I'm going to have another vodka. I love you all very much. Mwah, 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 mwah.